a certain thing on. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Chief Bearskin, please give me your full name, date, and place of birth. I'm Leifer Bearskin. I'm Chief of the Wanda Tribe of Oklahoma. My date of birth is 9-11-21. Uh, and I was born southeast of Wyandotte, Oklahoma on an allotted la Indian land uh, in 1921. Uh, what were the name of your parents? John Bearskin and Myrtle Bearskin. What was her, uh, your mother's maiden name? Shaw. Myrtle Shaw, Shaw Bearskin. Mm -hmm. And um, I take it your father was the Wyandotte? Yes. And uh, your mother was white? Yes, my mother was, uh, uh, she claimed to be an 8th Cherokee and German and Irish. I see. Mm -hmm. And uh, what were the dates uh, and places of their birth? I don't, uh, well, my father was, uh, let's see, he died, he was 64 years old, and that was in 1928. And uh, in those days, I don't know where he was born, or my mother either. They were born in what they called Kansas Territory I see. at that time. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and did you know the names of your grandparents uh, at all? No, I, I didn't. Okay. Uh, and what degree of Indian blood are you? Well, I'm on a tribal roll of three-eighths, but my mother uh, insists, and my dad w told me at one time, or talked at one time, that he was a full blood. However, uh, I'm sure that isn't true as, as entirely full blood, but I know that he was more than half. More than half. And uh, <clears throat> because uh, I think the uh, full bloods in the tribe ceased about, oh, way back in the, probably the late 1700s or something, you know, because they got married with the French quite a bit, and white people quite a bit, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So uh, from the 1800s at least, I doubt if there were any full bloods in the one that tried. I see. In, uh, in your early uh, youth, what, uh, did you attend an Indian school or was it white school? No, I went to public school. Public right school. here in Wyandotte, Oklahoma. And then I moved down in the second grade to a little country school uh, down south of Wyandotte, about 15 miles. And then I came back to Wyandotte in the fifth grade and finished high school here in the Wyandotte, Oklahoma finished public school. Uh, what, in some of the schools that you attended, were they one-room schoolhouses or were they Two-room. The country school was a two-room schoolhouse that had a, a, an accordion partition across the middle and it separated uh, uh, from the first through the fourth in one side and from the fifth through the eighth in the other side. How large of a school? I mean, how many students? Oh, for heaven's sake. I'd say uh, probably 30 students in all at the moment. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the subjects that you were taught? Well, we were taught the regular curriculum at that time was reading, writing, and arithmetic, mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of things. What was some geography? Your, what was your favorite? Uh, I don't know. That I had a favorite. <laughs> 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 I tell you, one problem I had was spelling when I first in the second grade, uh, previous to the second grade. I had a wheel of time spelling, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you a little story. Uh, we had those old chief's tablets then. They had red uh, covers with a chief's head on them and blue cross marks and that sort of thing. Well, two or three of us young lads got together and we decided that the teacher would give us a spelling <clears throat> lesson each day and they were in order that they were in a book. Well, what we would do is we would write real hard on the first page and throw it away. The indentations would be left on the second page and when she'd give us a, the words, we could look sideways on those and see them. So, uh -huh. Well, she cut on that right away and if she changed the word around, that just ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, then uh, I think it was in the latter part of the second grade, <clears throat> and for some reason that I know I don't know how it happened, the light went on. And since then I've been a bug on spelling. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, right now I have a system here in the, in the tribal headquarters that if any of my uh, clerks or secretary gives me a letter and I find a, a mistake on it, it costs them a nickel. Now, if they get me to sign a letter that's got a mistake on it, I have to give it a quarter, and those oh. money goes into the coffee <laughs> fund. <laughs> well, I, but I since that time, and for some reason I don't know why, I've never had a problem with spelling. But I think uh, a little bit when I got a little further along, uh, arithmetic and math in high school math, I just ate it up, and and uh, it just came natural to me for some reason, uh -huh. and it was my easiest subject and best subject. I think English was my worst. <laughs> Well, my math was mine. But, uh, <laughs> did you grow up on a farm? Yes, we lived out you know, on a lot of land southeast of Wyandotte until I was about, well, in the first grade, I think six years old or seven. <clears throat> and uh, then when we moved out to the country, in the country school, I, I lived on a chicken farm uh -huh. and, and a regular farm at that time. What were some of the chores that you had to... Well, on a chicken farm, we had to gather eggs night and day. 
and that was a kind of a it was a chore for us, but we had it we had to do it. And uh, the, the chickens we had were white leggings, and we had a great high wire fence. Well, leggings can fly. And they'd go all over the hillside, they'd go under the house, and we'd crawl under there and get eggs, and we'd ask them, maybe we couldn't carry them in our hands and crawl out, and we'd put them in our pockets. Oh my. Well, you know what ensued after that sometimes? <laughs> Did you ever have a nice egg in your uh, pocket? Well, no, but I but, can imagine what it feels like. <laughs> and we had to feed the chickens. Mm -hmm. And uh, we all had chores to do before and after school, and they had to be done before we could go play. Mm -hmm. And then out on the farm, we had a, a great big garden. And uh, the main problem there was weeds. You know, we were after weeds night and day, you know. So we'd have things to do in the morning before we went to school. We'd have to do them at night before we could go play. And uh, just a regular farm chore, mm -hmm. feeding and weeding and those kinds of things, taking care of uh, what we grew. And how many brothers and sisters did you have? Well, my mother had 11 children. Oh my. Now, my, I had a twin brother, and uh, we were the youngest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Some of my uh, older brothers and sisters died even before I was born. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> my mother lost... Uh, I think it was three children in about two months in the flu epidemic. Uh, oh, I think it must have been back in the late, or the early 1900s, around 19, uh, I guess 18, and, and around that area. Yeah. We had a huge flu epidemic through here, uh -huh. and uh, you know, uh, Indians didn't have a uh, resistance to that type of thing. And uh -huh. she lost three children in one in two months. Oh my! But did they? Uh, <coughs> During that time, did they know what to do as far for the flu, or did they just let it run its course? No, it was one of those things like malaria. You know, was first introduced among Indians a long time ago. In fact, our tribe up when we first met the French, and some of the French uh, uh, Wyandots up now up in Quebec will tell you that the French sort of helped that along by giving them malaria-infected blankets. Uh -huh. uh, some of those infectious diseases that were never here before, they were just uh, they didn't have any cure for. Them. Most of the diseases that the Indians had were cured by herbs and things like that, but that's the, the diseases they had that could be cured by that. But when the white man's diseases come along, uh, malaria and even just a common flu, uh -huh. you know, they never had flu before. And there wasn't any, uh, they didn't have any medicine to fight it, and they didn't know how to cope with it, and many, many Indians died because of that. Um, <clears throat> you say you were born in 1921. Uh, did you uh, serve in uh, World War II? Oh, yes, yes. My twin brother and I were both, uh, well, we joined the uh, the service before uh, before the war. What branch? And I came I, in the Air Force. We were both pilots in the Air Force for 21 years. Oh, really? Yes. What was, uh, what is your brother's name? Leland. Leland? Uh-huh. Uh, uh -huh. Is he still living? Yes. Uh -huh. um, so, uh, did you uh, have any, uh, or, or did you serve in the European uh, Well, he was in the European theater and it, uh, over in the, the, uh, that area in Italy, North Africa. <coughs> he flew uh, the cargo airplanes, and I flew a uh, heavy bomber during World War II. Uh -huh. I was over in the Southwest Pacific area, oh, up right. in uh, New Guinea, and flew against the Japanese. Uh, what was your, uh, uh, <coughs> your rank in the, the country uh, that you were with? Well, I joined the uh, Air Force, the old Brown Shoe Army Air Corps, we used to call it. It used to belong to the Army a long time ago, uh, when it was an Army Air Corps in 1939. Uh -huh. And uh, I spent 21 years with them, and I retired. I, I enlisted as a private in the Air Force. And then when the war broke out, I had a high school education, and uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to be a pilot, but I couldn't because I didn't have a college. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and when the war broke out, they lowered the requirements to high school education. I immediately applied for pilot training, and my brother and I both did. And he was down in the States, uh -huh. so he got processed through uh, uh, into flying school before I did, but we both graduated as Air Force pilots from the flying school. Where did you uh, do your basic training? I, uh, basic training was at uh, uh, Hemet, California. Oh, really? And, uh, I mean, the primary training was at Hemet, California. In those days, we had three categories, primary, basic, and advanced. My uh, primary training was at Hemet, California. My basic was at Bakersfield, California, and I graduated from a twin-engine flying school in Williams, Arizona, right next to, uh, right close to Phoenix. Were you living in California at the time when the war broke out? And that's no, I was, a, I was a sergeant in the old Army Air Corps, and I was stationed in Alaska. Oh, what well, were you? I, mm -hmm. I was an airplane mechanic, and uh, I was what we called in those days a crew chief, and I had three airplanes under me, and, and uh, six crewmen, two two people on each airplane, and I was a sergeant. But we called a buck sergeant, a three-striper. Uh -huh. 
Well, what uh, led you to, to join the service? Uh, well, I was here at Wyandotte. I graduated from high school, and uh, there wasn't any employment here. And I didn't, I wanted to go to college, but I didn't know how. I didn't have any money. Right. So <clears throat> what I did was uh, I went to Bacon, uh, put in an application to Bacon Indian College down here in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And uh, I was uh, uh, told that I was about to be accepted. Well, <clears throat> I went to, uh, I was up in the county seat of Miami uh, with some of, two or three of my uh, cohorts at that time, and, and uh, we talked to a recruiting sergeant there about the Army Air Corps. And he advised me at that time that, that they were going to lower the requirements for pilot training to high school education, and if I came in, and by the time I got through boot training, which was eight weeks at that time, I'd probably be able to go to cadet school. Uh, and pilot training, and, uh, and uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> you think so, he kind of pulled Yes, he pulled my leg a little bit. He brainwashed me a little bit, I'm sure. But uh, when I uh, got through boot training, I went in to see the squadron commander to see if I could go to pilot training. Or the first sergeant, really. I saw the first sergeant. You very seldom saw the squadron commander in those days. We had a, a sergeant who ran everything. And uh, he told me I couldn't go. And I told him, well, the recruiting sergeant told me I could. He said, I don't care what he told you, you know. But anyway, uh, three years later, I was in Alaska when a war broke out. And then I immediately applied. And uh, I flew uh, four engine aircraft mainly from that time my whole career. What were some of the battles that you uh, were involved uh, with? We flew, uh, my crew flew 46 missions out of New Guinea against the Japanese. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we came back. Uh, uh, to the states, all of us together, except the co-pilot. Our co-pilot checked out and got he became an airplane commander and got his own plane and crew. And I went through two, uh, three co-pilots that same way, and they would, by their experience, move on and get their own crew. Mm -hmm. But my whole crew came back to the states, all of us together, and we never got a scratch. Really? Yeah, we were real fortunate, and I think uh, uh, there's somebody upstairs watching us all the time because we came through some scrapes that you couldn't believe. Uh, and other people got shot down or shot up and people killed and that sort of thing. We were right alongside them and we came home time after time without a scratch. Uh, <clears throat> we came back to the States. Uh, I was a second, I was a, a what they call a flight officer, which is a one, one rank below a second lieutenant uh -huh. uh, when we first started. And uh, I got promoted to captain before I came back from combat and uh, then I went up the ladder and I when I retired in 1960 I retired as a lieutenant colonel. Uh, how many were in your crew? Um, ten. There was ten a uh, crew of ten on each bomber at that time. And uh, did you come back after the, the, the war uh, was over or did you spend some time no. in, uh, in occupied areas? Uh, we were required at that time to fly uh, 315 combat hours, and then we would return to the States, which we did. <clears throat> and we completed all these missions and everything in, in nine months, and we were back in the States. Well, at that time, I anticipated being in the States maybe six months or a year and reassigned on a combat crew to uh, Europe. But that didn't happen. I became a staff officer, and I went behind the desk. I became a squadron commander. Uh -huh. And I, I, didn't, I didn't get back into combat. I stayed in the States from that time on. However, I did. I was in the occupation force in Japan, uh, Korea, and uh, I was on the Berlin airlift during that. Oh, you uh, were. I flew on that during that time. And uh, in 1952, I believe it was, <clears throat> I was assigned to a fighter base down in uh, Georgia, and we flew the. Uh, I was in, in the group that went to uh, Japan, and we flew. Uh, jet fighters across the Pacific for the first time in history. Oh, really? And uh, although I didn't fly the plane itself, I went on that uh, mission as uh, I was the Air Base Group Commander on that mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the uh, Berlin Airlift that, and I spent a year in Korea. I spent uh, about two years in Japan. And uh, I've been in North Africa, England, uh, Alaska. Alaska was foreign service at that time. And uh, and quite a few places in the world, and most of them involuntary. <laughs> but uh, it was a great experience. I love my experience in the uh, Air Force. After I retired from the Air Force, I went to work for the Air Force as a civilian in the Federal Civil Service, and I worked in the missile program and uh, in the uh, bomber, tanker, and uh, missile program out in uh, California in the 15th Air Force for 20 more years. 20 mm -hmm. more years. So when did you return to uh, this area? I retired the second time from the Air Force in 1979, and I came back here in, in 1983. I was elected chief of the tribe. I see. I, uh, mm -hmm. You just had this uh, 
yearning to come back here to your place? Well, place? I guess uh, I've heard a lot of people say that, oh, why not, you know, what is here and all that kind of stuff, but it has a, a, a fatal attraction for retirees, I think. Anyway, <laughs> it's peaceful, quiet, and it's country, and I'm no country boy. Mm -hmm. And my twin brother retired in 1961, a year after I did, and he came back here and he bought 33 acres out here at Twin Bridges. Well, he's lived here all that time, and when he, when I retired, then I bought the west half of that place, uh -huh. and we both, we live right around the corner from each other. I see. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, he was the first Indian pilot that ever flew to the South Pole. Oh, really? Uh-huh. And he dropped, uh, supposedly, he dropped a, uh, a flag on the South Pole when he flew over, you know, for, for publicity, and also, uh, he presented a uh, state flag of Oklahoma that he did take with him to the governor when he returned. Uh, he flew to the South Pole about four or five years in a row. What, what uh, years were, were they? Oh, if I can remember, I don't know that I can remember. Uh, they flew out of Christchurch, New Zealand, and down to the South Pole on the uh, deep freeze operation where our people were down there analyzing and doing a whole bunch of things. And uh, <clears throat> It seems to me it was probably in the, in the middle 50s or somewhere along in there. I don't remember when that mission took place, but he was in it for three or four years. Uh, he's a, a great pilot. He got many, many hours in the air. He flew all the time, and I flew an airplane and a desk at the same time. <laughs> <you know. laughs> well, now at the Berlin, Berlin airlift, uh, uh, we don't have much in the way of information on that. Uh, what were your impressions of this? How were the people? Uh, I'm sure the Berliners were grateful, uh, or <clears throat> were they? Well, they were tremendously so, especially those people in Berlin, because they had no supplies. They didn't have sugar, they didn't have coal, they had no foodstuffs at all except what was flowing into them. And of course, this was our a retaliation, you might say, to the uh, Russians for closing it off. And we went into the air and got them in there. However, they made it very tough on us. Uh, I flew 29 missions there. I was a squadron commander there behind the desk, but I managed to get out and fly 29 missions into Berlin. And we flew out of a British zone into into uh, Berlin with four-engine cargo aircraft, and they had a 10-mile-wide corridor into Berlin, a 10-wide out, and they just flat told us if we got outside of that uh, corridor, they'd shoot us down. Did you and, have any incidences where something like that? <clears throat> no, we didn't get shot down, but we had many instances where you have a thunderstorm right in that corridor and you can't get around, and you go through, and we'd have some crashes on that account. Oh, really? We also had uh, with the we flew into Gatow Aerodrome in Berlin. And uh, we'd have a load of coal, sugar, or food, and uh, we'd go in. And there were so many airplanes flying in there, British airplanes, twin-engine airplanes, four-engine airplanes, and all of that. And when you fly in a traffic pattern with those diverse amount of, of aircraft, you have different flying speeds and all. It becomes really uh, complicated and keep them separated. But it was a tremendous operation. The people in Berlin were so thankful about that. And, uh, and uh, it, it was just a, a great, great air operation. It really was. And we would fly there, and of course uh, we have, uh, we'd have to fly through a lot of weather sometimes, and uh, I don't know if you know anything about weather flying, but you have a ceiling uh, that's a minimum, say 500 feet above the aerodrome. Uh, there I think it was 300 feet. And uh, if the weather's bad, then you blind fly all the way from your base there, and if you if you miss the aerodrome on your way in to, the, to load, ordinarily if you're on a regular aerodrome, you just fly on around and come back in and land. Uh -huh. We couldn't do that. We, if you missed the uh, airport, you just hauled your load on back to your your base, you know, because you got a hundred airplanes lined up behind you in the air coming around the land. You don't have time to bring somebody around. Mm -hmm. It was complicated in that that matter, and two, it was a temporary setup for blind approaches. You know, when you come in an airplane, you can't see. You're flying blind, and you come down and you bust a 200 foot ceiling at 140 miles an hour. You don't have much time to figure out you're on the end of the runway or not, and uh, this complicated matters too, in that you had so many airplanes coming in, and it was a great, great operation, air operation that really won. What was the general uh -huh. uh, tonnage that one, one of the planes that you would fly, how much could they accommodate? Well, we would carry probably ten or 12,000 pounds of cargo at that time. We had four-engine cargo airplanes. Of course, the twin engines were smaller, and they carried four or five thousand probably. But uh, uh, they'd have German crews that loaded the airplanes and German crews that unloaded them. And we would hit the ground, taxi up to our unloading area, and in about 15 or 20 minutes, they'd have that whole airplane unloaded. They'd have chutes there, and they'd have about six or eight Germans would jump in there and start throwing things out. And they'd have a truck back up there to pick it up and that sort of thing. And then we would immediately start our engines and take off again. And uh, it, it was a tremendous operation for everybody concerned. And I'm surprised 
uh, looking back now that we didn't have more air crashes and, and more loss of crews and airplanes than we did have. Right. And it was very minimal compared with the operation, the size of the operation. And how long did it last? Oh, I think it lasted uh, uh, somewhere as well over a year and probably a little less than two, if I remember right. I'm not sure. I came home in 1948. Uh -huh. I came before. I came back before it was finished. I was in Japan in the uh, uh, occupation at the time that I got assigned to Germany. We were in a heavy transport flying in, out of Japan, and they picked us up and transferred us to Berlin overnight, uh -huh. and we ended up in, the, in Berlin. So uh, at that time, foreign service we called it. Uh, you operated on points. How many times? How many? How long had you been overseas and accumulated? Well, I'd accumulated enough points when I went to Japan that I would finish my time there and come home before the group was rotated. Uh -huh. However, I got there and, and uh, I stayed longer than I was supposed to because you know it was interesting. Uh -huh. it, it was uh, uh, and, and I, I loved to fly, although I didn't get to fly a whole lot as much as I wanted to, being a squadron commander. And uh, I had to stay on the ground, but uh, it, it just—I wasn't ready to come home when they were when my points were up. So I stayed a little longer than I than I, uh, I could have come home earlier. But it was just so interesting I didn't. Your civilian career with mm -hmm. the Air Force. Now you mentioned missiles and uh, what did mm -hmm. pass the. Well, when I uh, before I retired from the Air Force, I was a lieutenant colonel and I was a squadron commander and assistant headquarters commandant at the Strategic Air Command headquarters in in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, that headquarters were the headquarters for all the combat areas in, in the Air Force. We had missiles, tankers, bombers, uh, and all the crews that flew them. And we were the strategic arm of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, General May, you might have heard about him, a rough old general was, at the, was a commander there at that time. And uh, when I, just before I retired, uh, the uh, missile base at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, had all the missiles in the world. That the United States had. They had the old Thor missile, the old Atlas missile, and they had the uh, uh, the Atlas was coming on board. I think and the old Thor and a couple of other models were before that. Well, when I got there, they they just got rid of the old Thor missile, and the Atlas was on board. And they were bringing on the uh, uh, I've forgotten which one now it was the middle one <coughs> uh, missile. Well. They wanted somebody with transportation experience, which I had had some transportation experience being behind a desk in the Air Force, and uh, and also somebody to take on looking at the ground handling equipment for missiles. Well, there was no, there was a prototype built, and was the only one in the whole world for that missile to handle that missile, and we had them on board there. We had uh, Martin Company, Boeing, uh, all of the uh, dy uh, uh, dynamic. What was it? Yeah, uh, I forgot the name of them. Anyway, there was a whole bunch of missile uh, contractors building missiles, and they were there. Well, they would build something. For instance, we had a great big old crane, a 100-foot boom crane that we got from England to emplace the missile in the missile hole in sections, half sections, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the only crane in B. It was built for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, my job was uh, uh, I was chief of the transportation and engineering division as a civilian in that uh, first missile division for the Air Force. And we had to test all of this handling equipment and watch its progress to see that it was uh, compatible and, and adequate to do the job. Mm -hmm. Well, this 100-foot boom, we only had one operator in the whole Air Force was a technical sergeant in the Air Force that could operate that boom. and. Uh, when I got there, uh, I saw this, and then I went and got qualified to do it myself. But uh, we finally ended up with four operators. Anyway, those kinds of things we had to look at. Mm -hmm. And we had to look at all kinds of equipment that was developed in the missile programs to see if it would work and do the things it's supposed to do, which was extremely interesting to me. And then I handled the transportation portion of uh, vehicles and all that kind mm -hmm. of thing, running around the base and that sort of thing in addition. And so they wanted somebody that had some transportation experience, and they didn't have anybody experience in ground handling equipment for the missiles because there wasn't any, you know, before that. So that was thrown in as a part of the job, which is the most interesting part of the job. And they came to me two times before I retired. One made it, it was a federal civil service job, and I hadn't planned to work for civil service. I want to go to Florida and retire because I've been stationed there because they got big bass, you know? uh -huh. and uh, I couldn't find anything suitable to do down there, and I couldn't survive on military retired pay. I had to have another job. And they offered me that job twice, and I turned it down twice, and finally they come to me and said, well, uh, come, we want you. 
and they were going up it to a higher position. And they said uh, they wanted, and so they offered it to me, and I would send them a resume, and uh, they hired me before I got out of the Air Force, really. Yeah. And uh, so I worked there for three years in the missile program. And uh, <clears throat> then at that time, they changed the organization. And we had a lot of civilians working there, and they cut down on the civilian force. Well, they made my, uh, they, they made my position a full colonel's position in the Air Force, and they eliminated my position. So I moved down to 15th Air Force headquarters at Riverside, California. Uh, 15th Air Force had all the missile, tanker, and bomber bases west of the Mississippi River. And I went in there as the transportation chief for that uh, air division, and then I got promoted to the division chief, and then I went into what we call logistics, war planning. Uh, they created a position there, a civilian position as the deputy for that division, and I moved over there, which was a promotion in, in status, but, status, but not in money. Uh -huh. And the same thing. And then I moved from there to, the, to being the executive officer for the director of operations in 15th Air Force headquarters. And there we had all the flying crews, all the airplanes, the tankers, bombers, and missiles under our control. And I was his executive officer right. uh, for the last several years of my career. And that's where you went. That's where you retired. From. I retired in 1979. I came back here. <laughs> um, and you say you were elected in, in '83. 1983. Said, well, what prompted you to get involved in tribal politics? Well, uh, everywhere I went in the Air Force, and and I've traveled all over the world. Of course, being an Indian, people want to know about Indian. Mm -hmm. And uh, in many occasions, I would be in a spot where I was the only Indian in that whole area, or at least the only one that would admit it. Of course, looking like I do in the name of Bearskin, you know, I stood out like a sore thumb anyway, and I wouldn't deny it because I'm very proud of it. But uh, uh, people ask me how I got started. One thing, I came back from combat in 1943. Uh, I went to combat in 42 and came back in 43, and I was assigned to a training uh, bomber training base out in southwest uh, Kansas, Little Kansas. And uh, after I got there, uh, there was one other captain on the base, and I was a captain at that time, uh, who had had any combat experience. So they put a, they had, there were students going through learning to fly the bomber, the B-24 Liberator, four-engine bomber. And uh, our job was to, to, uh, to teach these folks uh, military or uh, combat tactics and that sort of thing, what to expect when you get in combat. And that's all we did, we just teach the students that. And, uh, <clears throat> I came home one evening uh, from work, and there were four ladies from the Baptist Church at my home waiting for me to come home, and they wanted me to come, and, and what had happened, uh, after I got back to the States, I was presented, uh, uh, presented the uh, Distinguished Flying Cross for my combat flying, and it was presented to me at the, at, a, at the base in Kansas. Well, this got into the local newspaper, and these people... Uh, seeing my name in the paper knew I was Indian so they came to my home and they were waiting there when I came home and they wanted me to come talk to them about India and I said well what specifically do you want to know about Indians well statistics how many were there then how many there are now and where are they well I said I don't have that information I said I know very little about India and they said oh we got a book if you'll read it and come talk to us <laughs> I was like <laughs> they just want to hear it India uh -huh. well I did and I went and talked to them and then everywhere I went from then on, you know, it grew and grew and grew. So I had to do a lot of research on Indians, and I did. And uh, so I've talked to Indians from, from uh, Korea to, to Germany to Japan and all over the world. And anybody that listened, and I love it. And I like to talk to people about Indians. Uh, generally now, I travel around the country here to school, and I take those little girls to do the Lord's uh -huh. Prayer when I can. And uh, I like to I like to do things like that. and, and uh, uh, the one thing I like to talk about is modern day Indians, which is kind of dry, you know. And as they like, most people like to hear, like children, they like to hear about the war paint and ponies and stuff like that. And you'd be surprised. I get about the same questions from adults as I do children, right. youngsters. They want to know about the old days, you know, and why Indians did this and why they did that and, and that sort of thing. And uh, it's, it's sort of. Uh, uh, funny about things like that, there are very few people that know anything about Indians, right. and that includes Indians themselves. Everywhere you go, I can go right. I can talk to people in Miami. They don't know anything about Indians, and we're surrounded with eight tribes here. Uh, funny incident happened to me. Are we getting diverse here? Well, funny thing happened. I had heart surgery in 1984 in Tulsa, in the Hillcrest Hospital, and I had five bypasses put in. <clears throat> and when they got me out of intensive care, put me in, a, they put me in a private room, and uh, 
I noticed a lot of people walk by the door, you know. And uh, when I first checked in down there with a cardiologist for all my tests and all, he was an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard or not, Dr. Uh, what's his name? I forget. I'll think of it pretty soon. But anyway, uh, he was an Egyptian. And he found out that I was an Indian. And he also found out I was a chief. So he put on my medical records, chief of the wind up tribe of Oklahoma, his occupation. Uh -huh. Well, he talked to me for about 20 minutes about India, and I said, hey, old buddy boy, I want to check my heart, you know. <laughs> anyway, I, that got around the hospital, and people would come by. The, now, here we are in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the middle of Indian country. People come by to look at me, because here's a real chief laying mm -hmm. in your bed. Mm -hmm. I told my wife, bring my headdress, and I'll put it on, you know, but that's that's, they do that, and people would walk in, and they, they, their first question, are you a real chief, you know, and things like that. And one old boy came about halfway in the room one day, and he said, uh, my father's down the hall, had uh, the surgery, and says, when you get up walking around, would you go by and see him? He says, I told him there was a real Indian chief down here in the, in the room you know, on the same floor. He says, uh, I'd like for you to go by and talk to him. I said, well, I'd be glad to. And he says, you know, I'm an assistant chief. I said, oh, you are? What tribe? He says, I'm assistant fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are in the hospital in the middle of Indian country, and, and people coming by yeah. wanting to see a real chief, and that's real odd. Uh -huh. And so I, I, I think the fault is with ourselves a whole lot. Yeah. We don't tell people about ourselves. Well, well, we far too many times they, they uh, perpetuate the stereotypical Yes. Indian, rather Period than mm -hmm. rather than uh, present mm -hmm. the way it really is. Yes. I'll change the tape real quick. Was there any particular special uh, instruction that you received when you? took on the position of chief, was there anything that you can credit giving you the necessary background to take on a position like that? No, I think a little bit of background probably leading up to that might be helpful here in, in that <clears throat> when I first came back here, I had some some uh, uh, delegation from the Wyandotte tribe coming and want to know would I run for chief. Well, even though I grew up here, uh, I've been gone for 40 years, you know, and a lot of the people didn't know me. They were in the present administration, the present being, although a lot of the old-timers remembered and, and that sort of thing, but they didn't know me. And uh, at the same time, I had purchased this uh, west half of my brother's place, and I was getting ready to put a home there and all that stuff, and so I just told them I really couldn't, I didn't have the time, and I couldn't do it justice. So our chiefs elected for two years. Well. When the next election came around, they came to me again, and I still wasn't ready because I, I was fixing my place up, and uh, then the third time they came, and I said, well, uh, I will run for chief, and uh, the former administration, uh, uh, they weren't too aggressive and they weren't doing a lot of things uh, uh, perhaps that could have been done, and uh, not their own fault, I think, because they hadn't done things like that before. <coughs> So I told them that I would run for chief if, if they'd help me win. I said, I want, I'm not a loser. I want to win. Uh -huh. And I want to be chief. I've, I've done a lot of it, uh, visiting with the business committee and, and that sort of thing. And I wanted to be chief. And I told them I did. So we got a network going, and, and uh, I wanted to be chief by 12 votes. <laughs> well, now, who was your opposition when you ran? <clears throat> well, the, the former uh, people that were in, in office. They had a chief, second chief, and... and at that time, three council persons, mm -hmm. and they ran the affairs of the tribe. So we brought in a whole new business committee and chief and second chief so at the same time. The whole thing was just a clean yes. sweep. Yes. Uh -huh. um, well, since we've touched upon that, what is the basic structure of the Wyandotte tribal government? We have uh, the uh, business affairs of the tribe are conducted by the business committee, and they're elected every two years. That's a chief, a second chief, and we have now four council persons. We rewrote our constitution. And uh, incidentally, at that time, when we rewrote our constitution, we had a six-member elected body, which is elected every two years. And uh, we, we set it up so that we would elect half of our people at one time, so we'd have continuity of experience if we turned over the whole business committee again like we did. We came on board uh, one person, the secretary, a treasurer, was re-elected, and we asked her to be re-elected for her experience, and all the rest of us were new. Uh -huh. So we just started from scratch. 
and what we did the first month we were in operation, we sat down and we, d we discussed among ourselves where do we want to go and what do we want to do. <clears throat> we set some long-term objectives and, uh, and those generally were we wanted uh, health insurance for every member on the tribal role. We wanted dental insurance for all of them. We wanted the nearest, nearest thing to our heart was education for our youngsters. Uh, we wanted an old folks program. We wanted a youngster youth program and those kinds of things that we want to achieve uh, as a business committee for this tribe. Then we, we, we uh, set up a procedure where we went looking for economic development because we were dependent totally on government programs and we weren't getting very many. Uh -huh. Mainly because we didn't have the expertise in writing proposals and all that sort of thing and it was tough. <clears throat> so we set about getting something on board to increase what we had, which was very little. And uh, so we got a few more programs. Well, a few, a few more programs, we could take on a little bit more staff, you know, because we used some of the money in the program to hire people. And uh, so we expanded that a little bit, and we ended up, and I think you saw in our briefing today with the, with the programs that we have, <clears throat> we got on a little bit more staff to do that. And, and like I say, it's competitive with all other tribes. And that's by design to make it. There are a lot of things I've learned about the Indian world that are not good. And uh, anyway, uh, the, we conduct all the business of the tribe. We rewrote our constitution, and one, for instance, is that, that the old constitution said that you had to be a, a citizen of Oklahoma, living in Oklahoma, to vote. Well, we're eight miles from this line this way and 12 this way, and our people from Seneca, Missouri, Joplin, and here in Kansas would come to our meetings, but they couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing we changed. Anybody that appears, they're on a tribal roll, and they're of age, they can vote, and they, they register. And uh, <clears throat> several other things is control of our government and that sort of thing, some controls that we put in there. And membership would change it just a little bit, not much. For instance, uh, 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 I think on there before they had, uh, they didn't have some criteria listed that should have been on there. For instance, we put in you have to be a citizen of the United States, for one thing. Uh, I can't remember some of the other things just offhand right now, but there were some minor changes. And uh, we also put in there some things that, uh, uh, minor things like if you've been elected official and been thrown out for cause, you can never be elected official again and that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> now, when uh, the change in the Constitution, your, your original Constitution was 1937. Yes. And then you changed and mm -hmm. uh, adopted a new Constitution when? In 1980. I believe 85 we got it approved. In fact, we put in our uh, uh, revised constitution in 1983 and it took 18 months to get it through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Well, we thought that was a crime, but we're told it was a precedent. Most tribes wait for four and five years and some of them six years. And that's a crime. Why, why? I thought it was a crime for 18 months. What takes so long for something like that? Uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's all I'll comment on that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's, it, I thought it was a crime to wait 18 months. Mm -hmm. And the reason we got it through, and, and everybody tells us that is a precedent. Mm -hmm. Well, when it went to, uh, uh, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Washington to be approved, which I thought was crazy, if we're a sovereign nation, let's write our own constitution. The Bahamas, they don't question it. Mm -hmm. Puerto Rico, those people. And, uh, but it, that's the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I knew whose desk it was on in Washington. I call them every week as my follow-up day. Whatever I do, if I write a letter, Friday is my follow-up day. If I make a phone call, I write down and, and I call them every Friday. I want to, and I knew whose desk it was on. I would call them and say, "What are you doing about it?" They weren't doing anything. A uh, constitution ought to go up there and back in 90 days, in my opinion. And, and like I say, some tribes have had them for six and seven years sitting up there, and that's not right. But anyway, we got ours back, and and it was approved in 18 months. What are some of the problems facing the tribe today? Well, one of the biggest problems, I think, in my overall looking within the tribe itself is apathy. <clears throat> uh, there are not enough people that get involved, and this is not the people's fault uh, altogether. It's sort of a process of society. In Oklahoma, most of the Indian tribes are assimilated into society, and you have to have something strong, something good, to draw them back in as a tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> something to, to get them together and give them some pride and, and to be in a Wyandotte, for instance. you got you got to make them want to show up. 
And they have been not showing up for so many years. And this includes most of the tribes in Oklahoma. Lots of them. A lot of them have their things. The Quapaws have their annual powwows and that sort of thing, which is very good. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't had a powwow for, I don't know, I can't remember when. But I want to reinstitute them if I can. Now, those kinds of things that you have to look at, and you call people and say, hey, let's get together six months from now. Well, uh, they all have their jobs, and they all have this and the other, that, and there's not the pride that needs to be there that, that we get together as one does. We're trying to instill that in the things we're doing for one thing, and then later on we want to start a program where we really get into that sort of thing and teaching our youngsters program. Uh, <clears throat> the way uh, Indians have a built-in attitude uh, of depression, of apathy, of uh, lackadaisical attitudes, of defeatism, and it's there. You can see it a lot in real time. <clears throat> and I blame that to some degree. Well, a lot on society, of course. A lot on treatment by the government. <clears throat> uh, and I try to 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 say to people that yes, we have problems with the government. We have lots of problems, and we blame them a lot. <clears throat> and I say uh, the highest I would go is 51 percent of their problems. 49 is right in here to us. And uh, uh, I was a guest speaker in the Native American Press Association in Albuquerque a couple of years ago. And uh, and I told those folks that, that uh, I was going to name a bunch of Indians. I said, you know every one of them. Geronimo, Sitting Bull, Cochise. Uh, <coughs> and there's first. Chief Joseph, Captain Jack of the Modoc, uh, Osceo, and Seminole. Who didn't know those names? Everybody in the world knows those names. And I asked him a question, name me one chief, present day, that's known across the United States, or across any state, for fighting for his people like those people did. Just name me one. And therein lies a lot of their problems. Leadership. And like I say, it's not all their fault because the leadership isn't available. They don't have the capability. Uh, some do and won't. Uh -huh. And again, there's a lackadaisical attitude. <clears throat> you have to be, uh, you have to care about your people for one thing, you know. Care about every one of them. Not the good ones, bad ones, uh -huh. all of them. And you have to, to want to do something in that regard. And, and still know what the whole system is. We're a minority group. We're small. You know, we couldn't elect the President of the United States with our vote, but we might have a little impact in some areas. We could have some on local politics, but we don't. We don't, we don't get involved. And people don't because they never have. And therein lies the, the leadership problem, and we need some leaders that will get these folks together and make them proud they're in and at least fight for what they got right here. And the other is the defeated, defeatism uh, aspect is this, that they've done that for so long that they're kind of dependent on the government and they don't want anything else. Uh -huh. you know. At present, how large is the Wyandot tribe? Uh, as of today, we I have to recount now, but we're going to have a little over 3,400 members on the Wyandot tribe. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, of course, you added 50 more today. 55 today. 55. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. We're going to have about 3,470 people on the travel road, somewhere in that area. Well, you know, for so many years, they had them at a very low number, and of course, mm -hmm. I'm very, uh, I'm sure it's pleasing to you to know that the tribe is increasing in size. Well, yes. In, in fact, we got two people walked in this morning with two-year-old or one-year-old children they wanted to put on the road. Right. They didn't used to do that. And we're kind of proud of that. Uh, we think it's an achievement. We're really not, we don't know, but one reason the uh, road grew so, so large was our claims money. Uh -huh. uh, so people helps. wanted to get their money and they got on the tribal roll. Otherwise, they would not have. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but uh, the more the merrier, I think, and, and uh, uh, I just hope it grows to 5,000, uh -huh. you know. <clears throat> uh, as tribal members, uh, are they uh, generally prosperous or do they upon a large extent to the BIA? Well, uh, a lot of people in this area, we're in, in a low employment area here, and we 
we always have been in Ottawa County. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 500 of our wine dots here in Oklahoma and about 370 right in this area around the tribal headquarters. And we don't have any tribal land where they can live and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so the majority of our people are scattered over the United States. Some of them are prosperous, some of them are middle. I would say the majority are probably in low income. And around here we have quite a few in the low, low income uh, bracket. But we do have some that are prosperous, some that are fairly uh, doing doing pretty well, and uh, some who have educations and are competing in the, in the world out, out in the area. <clears throat> I don't know uh, tribal uh, nationwide what the employment rate is and or the, the average income. Around here, I would think in this Ottawa County that we have uh, the Wyandots themselves would probably be around $15,000. That's just a guess. Uh, uh, I think it's an educated guess, but that's not very much, mm -hmm. and uh, because of the employment rate, and, and this is a farming community, uh, dependent mainly on people supporting themselves to some extent. But uh, farming is not an industry that's conducive to prosperity anymore, you know. And of course, agriculture and oil being a, the major uh, industries in Oklahoma are both way down. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because of the depression in oil and, and agriculture itself. And the world has changed so much that, that uh, you know, farming is, uh, is not the way to go anymore. You know, you can grow your food, but you got to have other things than food anymore, money and that sort of thing. You said that the, mm -hmm. the tribe does not have any property? Uh, we have 188 acres as tribal land. See, we were one of the tribes that were terminated. We were right on the point of being totally terminated. The Peoria tribe, the Modocs, uh, the Ottawa tribe, a lot of several of the small tribes were terminated. This came about because of a law quite a while ago uh, to terminate Indians. Somebody thought that'd be a good idea. And uh, uh, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs and the, the uh, uh, government got together and instead of trying to terminate the great big tribe, like the Navajo, Cherokee, and the Five Nations and all that, they picked on a lot of small tribes. I think it was probably a test thing. And uh, of course, there was no resistance from the, top, the, the small tribe because they didn't have capability to resist. They didn't have any money for lawyers. They didn't have anything. And the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs made the point to go out and, and to convince those folks that it was a good thing to do to get rid of the government. They came to our tribe, and my oldest brother, who uh, I was gone at the time, of course, off in the, in the Air Force, and, and they had meetings, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs came up and convinced them that it was the best way to go because it, it would benefit them. They had their own land. Nobody would bother you, but they didn't tell them that you don't get Indian health services anymore. They didn't tell them you don't get education services. They didn't tell them you get human services, welfare, and that sort of thing anymore. They didn't say that. And uh, as strange as it seems, uh, the tribe voted to terminate. Uh -huh. And then we were almost terminated. Well, we were reinstated in 1978. All those tribes that were wrongfully terminated. Uh -huh. And uh, since that time then, for those period of years, they didn't receive any services from the government. And then... Uh, now, what years were they term terminated? 1956, I believe, is when they were terminated and they were reinstated in 1978. And then from 78 to, to 83, when we came on board, we had an administration in uh, that really didn't push to see. And, and, and it wasn't their fault, too. We had people that were not, uh, were not capable of competing with the other folks that had been doing it for all these years. And that put you behind. And uh, so we suffered. Well, what programs does the tribe offer its members today, if any? Well, uh, we've got this uh, uh, senior citizens program back here. We call it Title VI program, and we feed from 85 to 100 people every day for lunch. Uh, we have other programs for them in that category, and we're going to expand it, we hope. We have our health program here with the CHR, we call it the Community Health Representative. <coughs> we do blood pressure, blood sugars, uh, that kind of thing. She's not a doctor, she's not a medic, but we do those things and do referrals. Keep a uh, uh, record of, of the folks that we do, and we do that for our people. We deliver lunches from our dining service to uh, uh, shut-ins around the area. We have what we call a home improvement program that we get every year, and we administer that to fix people's roofs and, and maybe give them a new stove or give them some remodeling in their homes. We do that every year. And uh, we have an administrative program here to hire uh, the executive director is on that, on that salary, <clears throat> and we have our secretary on that salary and, and funded so we can have some staff to carry on these programs. Uh, let's see, we have 
the, the summer uh, adult program where we get fans and stuff for those people who don't have air conditioning and those kinds of programs. <coughs> we have somewhat of an education fund that we have combined with the other eight tribes and the Intertribal Council up here where we provide adult education and we also help some youngsters get their GED uh, things and that sort of thing. We participate with the other tribes in those programs. We participate with the other tribes in a food program, distribution program from the United States Department of Agriculture through the Intertribal Council, and we support that. In fact, I helped put that program in in ITC, Intertribal Council, and uh, that serves all Indians in the area. It's the same as a welfare service, you might say, if you want to use the word welfare, that all other people have, but this is reserved for Indians, and we got it for all the eight tribes in this area. Well, for all Indians in the area. You see, we have more than the eight tribes. We have more Cherokees in this area almost than we do the eight tribes. Oh, really? And they're south of us. Uh -huh. Well, they don't receive services from their own tribe because they're in our area. Uh -huh. And they don't receive some services here, some of the services that we reserve, like a home improvement or something, although we serve every Indian in our area that we can. Some services are reserved for our tribe only because that's all we get funds for. And that's real bad because we got other Indians in there that don't get anything from their tribe because they don't live at home. They don't get it from us because they're... They have their own place for it. Yeah. And it's terrible. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. so generally that's what we administer. <clears throat> and our economic development program is designed, we hope, so that we won't be dependent on uh, on the government. Uh -huh. We want to do our own and, and the programs that, that we get from the federal government are restricted to right here, people in our former jurisdictional area, which runs from the state line, Missouri state line over Mill Shoal River, uh -huh. twenty thousand acres. Well, I've got poor Indians and Wyandots out in Oregon that I want to help, but I can't do that with my program. So if we get our own funds going, and I got a, a, a an Indian out in a Wyandot family out in Seattle that wants a roof on their house, I'm going to Seattle and put it on. For them, you know, and that that is one of the big advantages of being self-supporting. As the tribal leader, what have you tried to do as far as the programs uh, to assist the tribe as a whole, and, and do you feel like programs that have been, that you've just talked about, are they successful? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we could use a lot more money than we get to do programs. For instance, the uh, home improvement program. <clears throat> I would like to set up an emergency medical service in this area. We're going to have to get enough money to do it on our own. For instance, we don't have ambulance service down here. Huh. The nearest hospital is Miami, Oklahoma, which is uh, 14 miles away. <clears throat> we don't have... Uh, uh, the nearest Indian hospital is uh, at uh, uh, Claremont, which is 80 miles away. And what I'd like to see done here is have some kind of emergency service, not just for Indians, but for the whole area, and mainly for Indians, a helicopter service or something like that where you can respond to emergencies and that sort of thing. Another thing I'd like to do is to work with the local community here, which we do now to some extent, in fire protection. And we have a volunteer fire department in Wyandotte. They have two-piece equipment and half time they don't run. But we've got Wyandotte Indians living all over this area, and what I'd like to do is get and work in conjunction with them on the emergency medical service, on fire protection, where we go out and, and we ensure that our Wyandotte's living all over this area. Not just Wyandotte's, everybody. Right. All the Indians, plus non-Indians. You know, uh, <clears throat> I use the example a lot of times in World War II, I saw a lot of blood from blacks, from whites, from Indians, from Irish. The blood is all the same color. Uh -huh. you know. And, and we'd like to provide that service around here if we can. <clears throat> it's just uh, uh, some things that are needed. They're sorely needed. And uh, nobody doing anything about it. You know, I, it's, just, it's real bad. But we want to get involved with them, those kinds of things. And someday get uh, financially able to do those things. What do you consider your greatest contribution so far to the Wyandots since you've been chief? My contribution? I think probably, I like to think, <coughs> it's instilling a little bit of pride in being Wyandots mm -hmm. and doing something, very frankly, better than the other tribes around do it. Mm -hmm. Pride, maybe a little more dignity, maybe a little bit more enthusiasm about about being themselves mm -hmm. and uh, get rid of, uh, rid of any idea that because they're Indian, they're not as good as somebody else. Uh, I like to think that. And I like to think that maybe we're setting an example in doing that by, we want to be the best tribe in this area. We want to be the best tribe in the whole United States. And when somebody says something about the Wyandotte tribe of Oklahoma, they know who they're talking about. So uh, these kinds of things we hope we're instilling, and we're trying to set it and do it by example. 
we want to do things better than anybody else, and we think we are. And uh, and uh, hopefully that'll expand and and uh, be a, a better feeling from all of our Indians. But now <clears throat> let me say this: that we have done, we think we've done a lot of things since we've been here, and uh, it makes it look, frankly, and I, uh, I maybe I, I hope I don't offend a bunch of people uh, previous to us, but. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot done, and we have done things, <clears throat> and of course it makes it a little bit more prominent uh, that we've done a little bit than, than you know, uh, than we've done before. Because we've fixed homes, we've uh, provided health services, we've provided food services, we provide things for people to do, and uh, uh, we hope it's been effective in bringing people together a little bit better, make them a little bit uh, prouder of what they are and who they are. On the same token, what do you consider your greatest disappointment so far? I think uh, one of the biggest disappointments in my whole career has been right here, and that is the lack of uh, cooperation, coordination, and work together of all tribes. Uh, I failed to get with the other seven tribes in this area. In fact, I have probably distanced ourselves from them because I think we all could get together and do more than we're doing to work for Indians. And uh, I have stressed that so much and I have been so frustrated in that area that we don't all get together and work for Indians as a whole. Uh, I have I was spent a year as president of the Intertribal Council. And I think it was the most frustrating year of my entire career. Uh, as an example, we have eight tribes here, eight chiefs. Mm -hmm. Well, the co are calling there the chairman. The rest of us are chief. Not one single time have we all gotten together to go to the Bureau of Indian Affairs right here in our own town to plan, to demand if we have to, to do things better for our Indian people in this area. Not one single time have we all gotten together to do it. Not one single time have we gotten together to go to the regional office in Muskogee area, office in Muskogee, Oklahoma, not one single time have we all been down there with an area director saying we want this for our Indians in Northeast Oklahoma. Not one single time. And it's been so frustrating and such a big disappointment <clears throat> that we all don't walk down the same path hand in hand and that we settle all of our differences and opinions and do everything over a cup of coffee and really go gun ho for Indians. And we don't do that. And I think that's the biggest frustration of my entire career for anything I've ever done. We don't do that. We don't do it across the nation. We don't do it in Oklahoma. And that is the most frustrating thing that I can think of. Well, that is my observation mm -hmm. in uh, viewing why Indians don't get more uh, in the way of clout because they have their petty squabbles either in some cases in tribes they have factions within the tribe. That's right. Or mm -hmm. they have ancestral uh, enemies mm -hmm. that they continue to, to this day uh, that they'll never get together, mm -hmm. and if they came together as a group, as a voting bloc, mm -hmm. boy, that set Washington on its ear, or even the local people on their ear. Well, so if the eight tribes right here in Ottawa County got together, we could dictate who ran Ottawa County. Uh -huh. it's, that, it's that important, uh -huh. and we don't. We and that's, that's sad. And that is the sadness, and to me, the most frustrating is not within the tribe itself. I think we're making a lot of progress within the tribe itself, uh -huh. but it's the it's the problem of getting all eight tribes to get together and work for leadership. And uh, I, very frankly, it's the leadership involved more than anything else. What does the future hold for the Wyandots? Well, I tell you what, I, I just think that the sun is rising and we got a, got a lot of good things to look forward to in the way of economic development. We think we're, we're on the verge of some great things. <clears throat> and when we do that, then we're going to achieve a lot of the objectives that we said a long time ago when we first came in. We want health insurance, we want dental insurance, we want education. The main thing is education for our youngsters. And 10 years from now, I would just love to see people with master's degrees running all of our private enterprises, running this tribe, uh -huh. and out there with a lot of youngsters behind them wanting to do the same thing. Uh, do you, uh, of course, I didn't hear all the economic development uh, future plans, but uh, you think that that uh, has a real chance of, of 
happening. We've been working on this for some time, and our consultants are Mr. DeGeer and his associates down in Tulsa. <clears throat> We're on the verge right now of putting together some economic development programs, and, and uh, frankly, I'll say this, that <clears throat> we're working on a trucking industry uh, that's just right around the corner. We're dealing with uh, one of the best trucking uh, uh, companies in the United States. We want to get together. We can provide them with a lot of... Uh, advantages and we have tax exemptions and that sort of thing. They want to grow. They're in a position now where they want to grow to be the biggest trucking industry in the United States in five years. Mm -hmm. If they get with us, we can do it in three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking at some other things like an insurance company itself. We're looking at some banking things and we're looking at, uh, uh, we're even looking at a racetrack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a dubious thing, but mm -hmm. we're looking at things and we've almost got them in hand with the trucking industry. Now, if we get that <clears throat> and we grow like we want to, we'll provide all these things we want for our people. Um, do you have much of a problem with uh, drug abuse and, uh, or substance abuse in this area? We have no uh, statistics on that other than I might say this. We are part of the community and we are assimilated into the community. So whatever uh, uh, relates to the community relates to us generally about the same thing. I believe that we have more unemployment among Indians than, than, than <coughs> non-Indians in this area. And <coughs> uh, I don't call it out-and-out -out prejudice uh, or discrimination. Excuse me. I believe that part of it at least, or a good part of it probably, is the qualifications of Indians in this area. <coughs> they're not educated. They're not college graduates. <coughs> in fact, some of them don't have high school education. They're not trained in, they're not skilled labor, they're unskilled labor, and they're in that category, <clears throat> possibly not faults of their own because they, they can't afford it or something like that, but uh, I believe that that has some, uh, a great bearing on it, and that they don't have the capability to do better than, than they're doing. Well, Chief Bearski and I don't want to uh, take up much more of your time, but I do appreciate your uh, mm -hmm. granting this interview, and I've enjoyed my experience here uh, today, and I certainly hope that I got a list of names to give our oral historian, so he'll be back. Good. And hopefully I'll be back. Uh, well, we hope you come back. <laughs> and uh, and <coughs> anything that we can do uh, down at the Historical Society as far as coordinating uh, information or anything like that, well, feel free to, to uh, contact us. Well, we'll do that. And that's what we're there for. Yes, and uh, we do want you to come back, and your associates, whoever they might be, are welcome here, and tell them come during the lunch period, we'll eat it. Okay. They can eat with it. But uh, uh, we're very proud of what we have. And uh, I hope you come back next year. And we think we'll, we'll be a lot prouder next year than we are this year. We, will. Yeah. Uh, we hope we're prouder this year than we were last year. And we think we're making progress. And uh, I think one of these days, the uh, Wind Up Tribe of Oklahoma's name will be known all over the country. Well, that's great. It is the place it's done. <laughs> well, thank you. All right. Can I help you with some of that equipment? Yeah. Okay. Um.